What's up guys, I'm Ari Rochelle and this is Too Deep. A common argument atheists use against Christians is that Christians are basically just atheists as well. The only difference between the atheist and the Christian atheist is that the atheist doesn't believe in one more God than the Christian atheist does. This is an interesting thought. In fact, throughout my childhood, I've heard Christians basically say this exact same thing when either defending why it's okay for them to do something like yoga in one instance or why it's stupid to even be interested in mythology. Now, if you know anything about me, I'm very anti-Christians participating in yoga because of its spiritual use in Buddhism, which you know what, maybe we'll go into a little deeper in another video. But you also know that I'm a huge mythology nerd. I love reading and studying other religions. I find them all very interesting and fascinating. Now, I want to quickly clarify that I don't like study them as if every word is fact. But at the same time, I do believe that almost every lie, at least every good lie, is built on a little bit of truth. So with that said, I won't ever argue a belief based on something I read in any religious or mythology book. I have and always will solely use the Bible to form and build my beliefs. I simply find mythology and other world religions fascinating. So with that little mini rant, mini intro, whatever it was out of the way, let's go straight to scripture. The very first time we see the mention of other gods in the Bible is Genesis chapter 31 verse 19. This is when Jacob takes his family and all that he has acquired with the help of God while working for Laban and he flees from Laban. It says, Laban had gone to share his sheep and Rachel stole her father's household gods. Rachel stole her father's household gods, but that doesn't necessarily prove that these household gods were actual gods. It just simply means that they had household gods. One could even argue that they're idols. So let's, let's take a look at what God warns the Israelites of of during the the night of the first Passover in Exodus chapter 12 verse 12 it says for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments I am the Lord this now begs the question how could God execute judgment on something that doesn't exist the answer is he can't now of course some would argue that you know this was just a figure of speech it wasn't it wasn't serious this this wasn't literal god isn't literally executing judgment on all the gods of egypt okay well fair enough no biggie now after this god leads the israelites out of egypt and into the wilderness so that they can finally return to the promised land while in the wilderness, God gives Moses 10 commandments to give to the people. At this point in time, these are the only commands God has. One could then understand that these must then be pretty important commands if this is all the people of Israel are given. And out of those 10, the first command must be the most important. So let's read that first commandment real quick. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The very first commandment God gave the children of Israel was not to have any other gods before him, besides him, or next to him, in his presence. Don't serve any other god. This then begs the question, if other gods aren't real, then why would this be the first commandment God gave his people after Egypt? One could argue that it's because they had just spent the last 400 years serving false gods and they had forgotten the one true God. I mean, when Moses was on the mountain and he was speaking with God and the Israelites felt like he had been gone for way too long, they even made a golden calf for themselves and said that this was the gods that brought them out of the land of Egypt. The danger is chasing after something that doesn't even exist instead of chasing after God. This is why that's the first commandment given. And to that, I would say, fair enough. But I have another question. Have you ever noticed how God describes himself throughout scripture? Like he says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, like in Revelation 17 and Revelation 19. 
It's one of the ways that the Lord declares his greatness above all others. We often declare these types of descriptions when we're expressing the need for spiritual armor because our true enemy, it's not mankind. It's not flesh and blood. No, instead, it's the spiritual realm that's around us. So look with me at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Paul says that we aren't wrestling against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. These rulers and authorities aren't flesh and blood, as we just read, which is why Paul states that Jesus has been elevated to his rightful position above all of the rulers. King James actually translates rulers as principalities, authorities, powers, and dominions in Ephesians 1, 15-23. Paul writes this because all of these things exist, they're real, and we're fighting against them daily. So he's encouraging us, the people of God. He's letting us know, hey, don't worry. They may be your enemy, but look at who's our God. Our God is above all of them. He's got you. It'll be all right. It's all good. Now, we see something similar to this in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. Moses, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, declares that God is the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, as well as the God of gods. How can God be the God of something that doesn't exist? Something that isn't real. Again, some could argue that, you know, God is just saying that he's above all false gods, so don't worry about them. So, you know what? Sure, you could say that. Except, why then didn't he just say they don't exist? Why would God allow them to believe in something that isn't real? Why didn't he correct them? Why would he allow them to believe in a false god and fear a false god that doesn't even exist? But you know what? That's fine. That's fine. No biggie. Let's say God didn't feel the need to correct their theology at that point in time, which is cool. Baby steps, right? All right. Well, Gabriel is one of two celestial angels that are actually named in the Bible. The other being Michael, of course. Now, when telling Zechariah that his wife would have a son and his name would be John, Gabriel declares that not only is he just any old celestial angel, angel but he stands in the presence of almighty god and he brings a message from god this is such a big deal that he says that that's basically the reason he has the authority to take zechariah's voice until john is born because of zechariah's unbelief this is all recorded in luke chapter 5 verse 25 now again I just want to make it clear that Gabriel makes it a big deal that he stands in the presence of Almighty God and he brings messages from God himself. Yet look at what he prophesies to Daniel about the end times and the beast of Revelation. Daniel chapter 11 verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods he shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done gabriel who stands in the presence of almighty god and sends messages from almighty god gave daniel a message from almighty god that declared he yahweh is the god of gods it's one thing to allow your people to declare that you are above things that don't exist but it's another to declare it about yourself Now, granted, some could still argue that God is referring to different spirits as gods since, you know, that's what mankind calls them. I mean, he calls things what mankind calls them, such as manna. That's not really the name of manna, but that's what mankind called it. So he called it manna. Okay, sure. That's fine. Let's go with that. But you know what? Let's let's take a look at two last verses. The first being Psalms 82 verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. 
Asaph really sets the scene for us. God takes his place in the divine council and judges the gods. This isn't figuratively or an analogy. This is Asaph writing a record of what has occurred in the third heaven where God abides. But, you know, don't let me influence you. Let's read what God actually says to these gods. Verse 6 and 7. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Now, some will still say that this is God talking to men, that he's talking to his prophets, and he's just kind of setting them aside as, hey, you're special, so I'm holding you to a higher standard type of thing. But if God is talking to men, then to die like men is no big deal is not a punishment because that's exactly what they are. They're men. Again, some could say it's a punishment because they thought themselves to be gods. Okay, well, there's at least two problems with that. I'll start with the second reason first. Ezekiel chapter 28 records the word of the Lord prophesying over the prince of Tyre and declaring that he is not a god but a man. And God tells him no matter how you set your heart, you're still a man and you'll always be a man and you will never be a god. You are not a god. Now, take a look at what his punishment was for trying to make himself a god when he was only a man. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 9 through 10. Will you still say, I am a God in the presence of those who kill you, though you are but a man and no God in the hands of those who slay you? You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. God doesn't make his punishment to die as a man because he is a man. That's not a punishment. That's life. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. His punishment was to die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners. This this isn't just your average regular death. This is an absolute disgrace. Now, with that said, the first and most important problem with the argument that Psalms 82 isn't talking about actual gods is that they are now calling God a liar. Why? Let's read verse 6 one more time. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. God said they were gods, not man. God declared who and what they were. No one else. The idea that there are no other gods is found in false understanding of what it means to have one God, the Lord. God never denies that there are other gods. On the contrary, he actually talks about them a lot, as well as bring judgment upon them and go to war against them and compare himself to them. To declare that there is one God is not declaring that no other gods exist, but that all other gods fail in comparison to the God of all gods, the one true God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the one true God, Yahweh. So that then begs the question, what are the other gods? Where did they even come from? Well, We'll talk of that in another video, but until then, let's just sum everything up in this video for you guys. There are such things as other gods. Though there are other gods, there is only one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His name is Yahweh. He is the only God who we are to serve. He is the God of gods who brings judgment upon the gods. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share and subscribe to our channel and until next time, God bless.